Hello everyone. Uh, good afternoon once again. Uh, I am uh, Shashi Kallada. Uh, thank you for joining in little early. Uh, we will wait for a little bit of time for others to join in. Uh, because those who are using Cisco WebEx for the first time, they take some time to download the application, etc. Uh, while we are waiting for others to join in, I will just give you a brief uh, introduction. Uh, why we are doing this and uh, why this uh, topic is having uh, importance. Uh, in the recent past, uh, you all must be aware that, especially in the last two years, 2018 and 19, uh, there were a lot of uh, fires on board container vessels, uh, which were basically uh, involving dangerous goods, mostly misdeclared or uh, even poorly packed containers. I request all of you to keep your microphone on mute to avoid echo back. Uh, so we have been doing a couple of webinars like this on open platform for anybody can join in and uh, understand the basics of uh, dangerous goods transport. Uh, in the past, we did uh, uh, various webinars, uh, one on LCL operators uh, responsibilities, one on ISO tanks, Another one on dangerous goods uh, consignment by C under IMBG code and uh, one on uh, GHS and uh, IMBG code comparison. Uh, while uh, myself and my contemporaries in the industry while discussing, uh, we realized that uh, there is a gap uh, in the sales and marketing department and uh, teammates. I'm not telling everybody is not aware, but uh, some of us in the sales and marketing are not aware about the, all the regulatory components of uh, dangerous goods by sea and uh, what can go wrong uh, if we take a business without envisaging all the restrictions en route through ports, bay ports, carriers, vessel operators, including different types of equipments. Uh, so this session, uh, we'll be mainly talking about how effective we can do sales and marketing call on dangerous goods and related uh, uh, even non hazardous chemicals, what restrictions or what hindrances we may expect or experience uh, when we execute those uh, business. So with me, there is uh, Bijoy Varghese, um, who is a veteran in the industry with more than uh, 25 years experience. Uh, he will be presenting on this uh, sales and marketing uh, strategy. Over to you, Bijoy. Uh, thank you, Shashi. I hope... Uh... Everybody is able to listen to me. Shashi, can you just confirm that uh, you are able to hear me? Yes, yes, uh, Bijoy, I can hear you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining in this afternoon. And uh, as Shashi has already disclosed, uh, we are going to discuss about some tips for sales and marketing uh, team with relation to uh, actions and uh, sales of uh, DG cargo uh, in, um, in shipping. Now, you may find that most of my discussions uh, will be a little bit skewed towards uh, ISO tanks because uh, that is mainly what I do uh, in my profession. But uh, most of your discussion uh, will also, uh, most of our discussion will also cover uh, uh, points which are related to dry cargo. Just uh, give me a moment, let me try and switch on my video as well. Maybe a technical issue with the video. Okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, we, we can still continue without the video, which uh, actually is uh, my preferred way of speaking. In any case, uh, I think we can move on to the uh, presentation right away. Uh, what we will basically cover in this presentation. Now, uh, as you know, we are talking about sales and marketing of uh, dangerous goods. And uh, what I will specifically cover would be topics related to uh, sales and marketing. Uh, they may, they may be, uh, there may be uh, some thought processes that uh, DG should be covered more in detail. So whenever there is any detail that you seek related to dangerous goods and any queries that you may have, you can either jot it down uh, and later on you can uh, post questions during the Q&A session and uh, Shashi will uh, respond to those questions. So this is the way we would like to take this uh, presentation forward. As you know, you know, the sales process uh, is usually divided into three steps. One is the pre-sales uh, where uh, uh, the prospecting of the customer is done. And the second step is the uh, quotation process. 
uh, where uh, we have to uh, go about making a, a quotation to the customer uh, and there are various points that needs to be covered uh, during uh, the quotation stage and the last stage is uh, when there is an execution of uh, a job uh, which has been confirmed where the quotation has been confirmed by our customers so you might you might find that some of the uh, topics that we are discussing are quite basic in nature but uh, the the main reason for bringing this uh, to our attention like also you know in any other training is not because we don't know of these things but several times many of these steps are skipped during the uh, during our uh, sales process and uh, when you skip certain processes, there will be certain fallouts of uh, skipping those processes. And uh, uh, then, you know, we will have to face those fallouts. So this uh, presentation will serve as a reminder for uh, salespeople. Uh, and it is more of a uh, kind of a reminder to people uh, than uh, an educational uh, kind of effort from our side. I'll move straight into uh, pre-sales. Now, the first thing is prospecting customers. Now, there are two, two levels at which prospecting customers is done. One is to understand and identify who is the customer that you go after. Now, when we go, when we go after shippers, we use one general term called shipper. Now, in shippers also, there are various types of shippers. There are customers who do commodities. There are people who do high volumes. There are people who do uh, low volume but high value cargo. There are people who do uh, chemicals in uh, solids. They do chemicals in liquid. In liquid also there are uh, different types. They might be doing it uh, in IBCs, in drums, in ISO tanks, in flexi bags. So uh, it, the important thing is to understand uh, which customer you are actually wanting to target. That is the first point. Now, uh, most likely when we, what we have seen in organizations is that uh, salespersons are given a free hand to go and develop customers. Now, who are those customers? Uh, is there any thought process that goes into that? Usually what happens is that the salesperson is left to his own resources uh, to find out those customers. So this particular slide might help you to find out those customers who are relevant to your business. So these are some things that uh, that we, I have learned from my experience. Best, the best, the very best way of prospecting a customer is referral. Now, you may already be having some customers. Maybe you have one customer who's dealing with uh, a product, say ethyl acetate, for example. Now, when you discuss with that customer, once you have developed a relationship with that customer, you will understand that there are also other shippers who are dealing with the same cargo. Now, if your customer can give a referral to one of his competitors or one of his friends in the industry who are not dealing with the same cargo, but he knows our exporters, this is the best way of identifying who is the next customer that you can go to. Another, another source of information is the manifest data. Many countries were able to buy manifest data. There are agencies to sell this data, you have to invest a little bit of money to buy the data. Now, once you bought it, that your work doesn't stop there. You must be able to spend some time to pour through the data to find out which are those customers who are really useful to you, which customers can add value to your company, because uh, you might find that there is a high volume customer, but maybe you have got certain uh, difficulties or disadvantages which you cannot target that particular customer. So. Use this data to your advantage. Trade magazines, like, you know, there is Chemical Weekly. There are various other websites uh, where uh, you can uh, uh, go and find out uh, which customers are dealing in which kind of products. And it is always advantageous to try and find out from those customers whether they have exports. Because the trade magazine may not only concentrate on export customers. They will also have domestic customers. So this is also one way in which you can prospect customers. Sales lead from overseas agents. This is a sure shot way of getting uh, the correct lead. An overseas agent is your partner. He also benefits and you also benefit when you uh, send him cargo or you receive cargo. In the case of exports, uh, when you're sending him cargo, he will be the receiving agent. So you can encourage your overseas agent to send you sales leads for businesses which are going from your country to their country. Then you can 
take the referral of your overseas agent that my agent in uh, xyz country said turkey he has given me your details can i uh, discuss with you related to your exports to turkey so and so kanzaini works with my agent uh, and and these kind of these kind of lines are openers for you to discuss with customers because it is if you would just make a a cold call or uh, without any kind of referral or without any kind of background the chances of that uh, uh, to be successful the chances of conversion are uh, highly reduced so always make use of uh, sales leads you will be amazed at the amount of data that is available on social media if you would use a platform such as linkedin you will know so many customers uh, which uh, you have not probably targeted before so um, linkedin has got certain advanced models premium models which uh, you could uh, maybe enroll yourself to which will give you uh, sales lead generation modules uh, this is also one way in which uh, you can increase your uh, uh, prospects for customers moving on to the next slide now we come to the nitty gritty now i found out which are those customers who have got work uh, who have got exports uh, for example from india to uh, to xyz countries now how do i find out who is the correct person many a times i've noticed that um, the sales people are completely confused uh, how do i find out who is the correct person whom i should talk to now uh, the answer is actually very simple many a times because we are used to calling people on cell phones the first uh, initial reaction is that i don't have the mobile number of the person concerned but uh, people seem to forget that there is also something known as a landline where you can call up and find out the actual person if you speak to the board line and say i'd like to speak to the person in charge of logistics uh, handling so and so commodity uh, chances are uh, very high that you know you will get a response from them again these trade events that you visit there might be certain exhibitions if you go to those exhibitions you will be exposed to various shippers in uh, in one uh, area there might be certain pavilions in certain trade e exhibitions and uh, you have a chance to meet with uh, the marketing people of uh, uh, those companies now the when you discuss with the marketing people obviously they are not the ones who decides the logistics you can get the correct lead as to the person who is the correct contact point to discuss related to logistics uh social media again if you would go to linkedin you can search uh, company wise for so and so company xyz and company limited who is the person in charge of logistics when you if you are enrolled to the premium models you will definitely get the uh, link to the correct person then the next point again referrals what if your friends will say uh hey my one one of my friends is in so and so company we used to work together in uh, my previous job now he has jumped to so and so job uh, and he is handling logistics there so your next question should be hey can you put me on to that person can you just introduce me just put in a good word for me can you share his contact details with me uh, when you do that uh, you can go to the new person with a level of confidence that yes i know one of your old friends Uh, can i uh, uh, can i discuss with you related to uh, shipping which uh, uh, i have already discussing with your other friend from the other company and maybe we can work together with you and uh, develop um, the exports uh, logistics work together so this is again a nice way of uh, breaking into the customers sales leads from the overseas agent we spoke already about this, uh, this uh, the overseas agent might be able to tell you the name of the exact person Uh, who deals with logistics so that's another way of finding out who is your who is the exact person to target now one of the biggest points which i have written last is for each of you sales people to think our job is not going and making sales calls we get we get paid for thinking for developing a relationship so if these models don't work for you you have to think out some solution it is up to you to find out that customer and the person in charge don't wait for anybody to hand it over to you on a platter nobody is going to do that your company will only discuss with you that you have come here with a specific purpose of attaining x amount of revenue x number of tus have you been able to attain that or not vast majority 
companies will only ask you for this. How you go about getting your customer is up to you. That you must think, utilize your intelligence, utilize your contacts, and take things forward. This is what we discussed about the pre sales. Now, in pre sales, there's one more thing as regards hazardous cargoes. Okay, when, uh, when you are discussing with uh, customers who are dealing in chemicals, first point before you go to a customer, be prepared. Who is the person you're going to meet? Who is the customer that you're meeting? What is his turnover? What does he do on exports? Which kind of cargo does he export? Most of the information you will find in the website. Any company, before you go and visit them, please make sure to visit their website and take ample information as possible, as much information as possible from the website so that you are better equipped when you discuss with a customer. When you go to a customer, you should go with confidence to let them know that, yes, I know what your company is doing and I know that you are doing all of these things. Did I miss something out? The respect that the customer will have for you will be different because he knows that you have already looked up certain things. You already studied certain things. Many of the large companies have got the SDS, MSDS in the old terms, uh, in, uh, already available on the website. Look up those SDS, pass it on to your technical teams, ask them, is this uh, cargo easy to carry? Can it be carried like this? Can it be carried in containers? Can it be uh, carried in IBCs? Can it go in an ISO tank? So this is all kind of being prepared. If the shipment has to go in ISO tanks, is there any special preparation that I should do for such so-and-so cargo? So when you go with these kind of preparations in your mind, your customer has got a different level of understanding about your ability. So make sure that you are uh, researching the customer better. If, uh, there's, there's another way to do it. If you, if you also look up the customer's competitors, if, if you know that uh, the customer is dealing with XYZ commodity, again, you go into Google, search out uh, this commodity from India, which other customers may be exporting. So again, you have some talking points to the customer. Supposing you already have a pre-experience of dealing with that cargo, you can you can drop drop hints during your discussions with your customer that uh, I know that this this particular cargo is usually sold to so and so markets. Are you able to develop these markets? So the thing is that uh, when you go with this information, your customer is confident that uh, you know what you're doing. You are a prepared salesperson, and you are <clears throat> going to be the right partner for them. Another point, when you're going to the customer, you should not only be prepared, you should also be armed, which means you must know your market. What are you selling? Whom are you selling it to? Who is your competitor? Know your market, know your competition, and know your product. There are, <coughs> excuse me. There are many, many uh, salespeople who blindly go and make sales, saying that this is what I have to offer. But you do not know what has what is the strength uh, of uh, your product. Uh, who are you selling it to? Who are your competitors? So the customer will take advantage of such uh, non preparedness because you do not know what the market is. So when you before you go, you must make sure that you know all of these things. You study these things carefully. Discuss with uh, other people in your team, with other friends from your industry. This will help you to know your product, the market, and the competition better. Now, we come to the next stage. You have identified the customer. You have found the correct person. You got and made your sales pitch. Now the customer says, okay, please make me a quotation. Now, <clears throat> when you make quotations, there are certain pointers that I have uh, place here for you, which uh, you can note down or you can you can just read through. Number one is stick to a template for a quotation. Many companies have got uh, a, a strict kind of a, a template to make a quotation. If your company doesn't have one, <coughs> excuse me, please make sure that you make a template for the quotation by yourself. Next point, if there is any special requirement, please mention it 
on your quotation that so and so hazardous cargo will have so and so requirements so that the customer is not caught unawares even if he is aware he might decide to hide that information from you it will be your prerogative your priority to inform him that these are the special requirements and this this is what i am going to quote for as a special requirement for example in iso tanks we have customers who will say hey i need baffle tanks in baffle tanks uh, there are <clears throat> three manlets so you need three gaskets sometimes they will say i need super tight gasket if it's a super tight gasket there are costs you have to mention those costs also understand there are standard trading conditions if your company doesn't have one you must encourage them to have standard trading conditions validity of the quotation quotations always need to have a validity be clear about the validity in the quotation this will avoid disputes later on one of the important thing is when to quote and when not to quote many customers i have noticed in my experience they will push you for quotations please give it quickly i have to finalize this tomorrow this is where your skill comes in if you quote too early you are giving the customer a chance to take your quotation to 20 other people and negotiate a better price if you quote too late you will be left out the next person who has quoted he will get the business so this is where your skill actually comes in a sales person should be skillful to know when he should make an offer when he should not make an offer how he should chase the booking how he should not get on the nerves of the customer but still chase the booking how to develop a relationship know when to stop these are the points that really brings out the skill of a sales person then you have must understand when you go and meet the customer you must understand his psyche <clears throat> many a times when you discuss with the customer you will be able to take out pointers this customer is a window shopper he doesn't have any interest to buy from me but he is only shopping this customer he wants cheaper straight even if i somebody else will give him 10 dollars cheaper he will run to that new new service provider then there are customers who are pre quotation people he has to show his company the customer that i have taken quotation from three people you will only be one among the three you may not be the one who is awarded then there is a digital platform platform shopper you see now that uh, everything is going digital and um, all negotiations of freight many many companies have started to move digital so uh, each kind of customer must be dealt in a different way now how they have to be dealt with is something for you to develop your skill these are just pointers for you to understand how quotations need to be made and what points you must consider when you make your quotation i hope that uh, i'm able to communicate clearly with you you people are able to listen and uh, the, the the subject is being covered correctly and adequately yes we try you know all right now we'll move on to the third level of uh, uh, the sales process which is execution stage now once the customer has been given a quotation and he has accepted your quotation what does the customer expect it is not as if your teammates know your customer already only you know your customer because you went and met with him you have understood his requirement has your colleague in the operations documentation customer services accounts have they understood no they haven't first thing there must be hand holding with your customer you must be able to solve certain points for them even before it is passed on to your colleagues and teammates whenever any new customer is onboarded have meeting with your teammates explain to them the background of this customer the background of, of the specific person that you're dealing with these pointers will allow your teammates to understand the customer better because your teammate has never visited him your teammate has got a different skill set than you you are the bridge in between your company your colleagues and the customer so it is your responsibility to make sure that the execution happens properly if the execution of the customer's business fails that customer will be gone for a long time 
no matter how much you will go to him he will keep on giving you excuses he will not give you work so this step is extremely important to bring the customer with your company together there might be some rare operational problems in the case of tanks i've given you some examples like dripping or valves are jammed or some nitrogen is leaking or uh, some missing parts rarely very rarely one one in maybe 100 cases you might find some issues like this step in yourself if it is a new customer do not leave it to your teammates so that the customer knows that you will stand for him when there is a problem if it is a normal dry container we have different kind of problems not able to gate in uh, form 13 uh, not available container not clean a uh, container not released by the depot these kind of problems especially for the first two or three experiences you must step in yourself so that the customer has got that confidence in your ability to resolve his problems the then comes the shipping and logistics process during in shipping and logistics there are several kinds of problems that can come up stand for the customer during that time again for a documentation sometimes uh, you know you, it is better that when you discuss in the beginning when you are introducing your customer to your team understand from him what kind of documentation need do you need straight bl do you need cway bl do you need surrendered bl do you want it courier to you what are the credit terms all these points you cover in the beginning don't wait till the last moment when the shipment has already sailed and then you are asking these questions okay sir what can i do for you what kind of bl do you want oh my company policy doesn't allow this i cannot give you this kind of a bl these points you should cover in the beginning when you when you bring about such negativity towards the end after he's handed over his cargo to you you leave a very bad taste and then the customer's repeat business will not come back for a long time so these are some of the important points that you should consider when you are doing sales and marketing of dangerous goods i'll uh, pass on the stage uh, the forum to uh, shashi now to uh, bring in a, a technical perspective related to uh, dg uh, for uh, sales and marketing team uh, thanks vijay uh, thank you very much uh, uh, this is uh, just certain highlights on uh, what we can expect uh, what things uh, or problems issues we can expect on uh, certain dangerous goods this is very uh, general restrictions by ports and this is not specific to a commodity or equipment number class 1 explosives as we all know they are uh, heavily restricted by carriers ports and uh, certain vessel owners uh, among class 2 gases ozone depleting substances may require import export permit this uh, it may get uh, delayed or arrested Similarly, class 2.3 toxic gases are having heavy restrictions by carriers. Uh, when we come to flammable liquids, generally ports may have uh, restrictions by quantity or uh, limited stay for uh, transshipment for packing group one and two. Uh, among class four uh, flammable solids and uh, other related goods, self-reactive substances and stabilizing substances may require mandatory refer. Uh, class 4.2 and 4.3 may have uh, restrictions to the way ports, including quantity limitation. When we come to class 5, uh, organic peroxides and oxidizing substances, organic peroxides may require mandatory refer. Among uh, class 5.1 oxidizing substances, against certain way ports are having uh, quantity limitations. Similarly, cargoes like uh, ammonium nitrate and other perchlorates. may require uh, may be you know imposed with quantity limitation or even carriers may have number of tu limitations on uh, class uh, 5.1 even uh, 5.2 organic peroxides some of these cargoes like calcium hypochlorite and ammonium nitrate may require uh, vessel owner's permission and additional uh, pni coverage vijay uh, can you just uh, skip to the next slide uh, when we are talking about uh, class 6 uh, toxic and infectious substances class 6.2 infectious substances are very rarely carried by sea because of the longer transit time uh, 6.1 solids and liquids may uh, have uh, port restrictions for especially for packing group 1 and 2 and uh, reefer operators uh, may not container operators may not accept the cargo uh, in reefers 
uh, because it is toxic. Radioactive materials, again, heavily restricted by carriers and ports. In fact, uh, International Maritime Organization had issued one circular encouraging the member states to ease up the transport restrictions for radioactive materials because it is affecting the global uh, healthcare industry. Corrosive substances, when we talk about class A, again, <laughs> reefer operators may not permit class A corrosive substances in the <coughs> And packing group one and two may attract uh, restrictions in the transshipment port. Class nine, we all consider class nine as miscellaneous dangerous goods, everybody will accept. But some of the class nine cargoes may be Basel Convention uh, restricted waste or others uh, like persistent organic pollutants like Stockholm Conventions. Uh, which may also attract uh, restrictions by uh, apart from class one to class nine, you know, also may be uh, Basel Convention goods. Similarly, uh, there are dual use chemicals uh, which, are, which is used in the commercial industry, but can also be used for making chemical weapons. So, when dual use chemicals are being uh, transported, import export permitted permits may require. And certain carriers uh, are having uh, uh, certain carriers are having uh, uh, restrictions on dual use chemicals. Similarly, there is a convention uh, for against illicit uh, drugs and uh, narcotic drugs and illicit substances uh, under United Nations. Those precursor chemicals are being transported. Again, import export permit may be required. Uh, and uh, one of the most commonly offered for transport and heavily restricted cargo is charcoal, which has resulted in numerous fires in the past. So that also may, uh, may be restricted by carriers or prohibited by carriers. When we talk about non hazardous liquids in uh, flexi tanks, uh, flexi tank operators uh, acceptability of that cargo, container operators uh, policy on accepting flexi tank, the non hazardous liquids in flexi tank. And uh, also we must envisage climatic conditions en route for the cargo. I have an experience uh, while I was working with a line, uh, somebody from Southeast Asia accepted, again, sales department was enthusiastic to accept a huge business. Every week, uh, 10, 20 foot container, flexi tank, vegetable oil, uh, sailing from Southeast Asia to Europe. They did not check with the technical team. Uh, when the, by the time the first vessel reached uh, Spain, this entire vegetable oil had become solidified and uh, the container has become like a balloon with a large solid uh, uh, vegetable oil chunk lying inside because of the lower temperature, ambient temperature. And uh, by then the carrier realized this, another couple of vessels were en route towards Europe. And uh, those containers had to be left in Europe till the summer coming because there was no heating elements fitted there. So, Apart from dangerous goods, normal goods may also have other restrictions and uh, uh, what you call permits required, additional documents required. Over to you, Bijoy. Uh, now, what we will do is, uh, you know, uh, we've discussed about the sales uh, strategies for hazardous cargo. Shashi has explained in depth about uh, the various hazardous classes, which is uh, basically a cursory information. And uh, many of you may feel that, you know, there is a need for uh, further understanding of hazardous cargoes, which you can also discuss with uh, Shashi offline after the meeting or uh, whenever it is convenient for you. Shashi also has got his own blog. Those who have not uh, uh, registered or subscribed, it's a free blog. Do make sure that to subscribe all my colleagues and teammates. I've recommended them to do that. I would also recommend you guys to go to the blog and read from there. There's a lot of information that he has put in there from many, many years. I will now pass on uh, the uh, forum to uh, Binoy, uh, who uh, will dis discuss with you on certain case studies that uh, we have uh, come across in our experience of dealing with ISO tanks. The, both the cases that he will discuss are related uh, to ISO tanks. And um, uh, you will find it to be useful to uh, to align your thoughts when you go for meetings with uh, customers uh, for hazardous cargo. Over to you, Binoy. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Bijoy and Shashi, uh, for inviting me uh, to this particular session. Um, quite happy that we are able to contribute in some small way uh, for the people who are joining in this field. So let me begin with. Uh, uh, a certain case study that that we come across and uh, particularly this particular case study that I'm talking to you about is 
uh, which Bijay also mentioned in one of his points, is that when the shipper contacts you with his requirement uh, for an ISO tag and is in is in a daring a hurry to get a quote from you. So what uh, typically happens is that uh, that he shares the SDS with you. In this particular uh, case study, I would like to specify the cargo name, which is ACN, which is a class three cargo uh, with a packing group one and UN number 1093. Now what happens in people who are in the logistics background already, who are already doing sales of ISO tag, Generally, it's a it's a standard that if there is a class three cargo or a class six or nine cargo, it is generally accepted, and uh, the salesperson, in his anxiousness to make an offer to the customer, goes it go ahead goes ahead and you know, makes a competitive bid to the shipper. Now, what is the problem? The problem is that shipper is now based on your based on your offer has gone ahead and spoken with his prospective buyer and made his offer to the, to the buyer. And what happens is that generally when this discussion happens, there is a deal that uh, strikes and the consignee then agrees to the rate and confirms the order to the shipper. Now, in a practical scenario, when the logistics person is providing the tank to the customer at the end stage, he's been made to aware by his technical team that this particular cargo, uh, even if it is a class three cargo, cannot be carried in T11 tank. And as per the IMDG code, this cargo can only be carried in T14 tanks without bottom bottom wall. Now this becomes a very tricky situation. You have already committed to your shipper. Shipper has committed to the consignee. Consignee is waiting for the order. There are some financial discussions that that has happened. There could be some movement of uh, funds that would have load from the consignee to the shipper. Now what do you do? Now you cannot go back to whatever you have said. So the ideal way, what is the solution to this kind of a problem? The solution is very simple. As a salesperson, when you get a shipper calling you and asking for a quote in a hurry, you must understand that it takes some amount of time to reasonably understand the SDS. You must clearly communicate to the shipper that this is going to take maybe one day or two day. And within that one or two days, after you have verified the SDS, whether it is compactable or not, you will tell the shipper and make an offer to the shipper. If you are not able to do that, and if you're not able to clearly communicate this to your shipper, chances are that, that you might end up in trouble. Now, when you have this SDS, what would you do with it? You would basically just go and check with your technical team just to be assured that whatever quotation you're offering and whatever cargo has been carried, whether it is compatible with the tank and whether you are offering the correct tank type to the customer as per the IMDG code. So these situations, uh, you know, many people would come across that once you have committed, then you are, you know, in a, in a, in a position that you cannot go back and you cut a very sorry figure in front of the client. So the, my humble submission to all our sales colleagues uh, in this field is that it's better to be checking this in advance rather than to be regretting at a later stage. So salesperson can also refer to the IMDG code and he has to ensure that it's compliant and all the relevant provisions of the code are being added to. Now let me take you to another example which is my second case study, similar case uh, where the shipper is contacting you with his requirement for the shipment, which is an ISO tag. He shares the SDS with you. Let me specify the cargo name. It's chlorophenol solid, unit number 2020, class 6.1 and packing group 3. Now the salesperson, uh, by the virtue of knowing that this is uh, a cargo that can be carried, checks the uh, rate from the carrier goes ahead and makes a competitive offer to the shipper. Now the shipper, similarly, he goes ahead and communicates uh, the order to the uh, the rate to his consignee and finally the deal is struck. Now what has happened? What is the problem that uh, that this particular uh, shipper, uh, this particular salesperson, you know, uh, went through? Now at the time of making the offer to the shipper, the salesperson was not aware or he did not clearly communicate that for this specific cargo, there is a loading 
an unloading process that he must follow and that communication did not go to the shipper and this has led to a big problem at the destination when the at the destination when the cargo was offloaded and when the tank was returned back it was observed by the technical team that this cargo has caused severe pitting to the tank now when when you have pitting to the tank obviously there is a cost involved to repair it it's a big damage and uh, that damage has got a cost which the sales person will now have to communicate to the shipper that he has to make it good or to the concerning that he has to make it good in most of the cases if you have not clearly communicated and if you have not followed the due diligence process it's very likely that the shipper will or the concerning will completely refuse to accept your claim so it's very important that the sales person uh, you know understands all these terms takes a clear clarity from the technical team now what is the solution the solution is again similar the sales person must check the cargo details with his technical team must be certain if the cargo is compatible with the tank that the cargo should not cause pitting to the tank so the from a, from a tank iso tanks perspective that as a sales person you should ensure that the tank uh, that you are giving should not be damaged after the utilization of the uh, of the shipper at the destination now specific to this particular car uh, cargo the loading and unloading process should have been clearly communicated to the shipper and consent must should be must be taken from the tank before offering it for loading when you get a confirmation that the shipper will follow the process then you are more or less certain that you are on the safe side now this particular cargo the tank had to be fully dry before loading and the product which should have been carried with a minimum uh, 0.2 0.5 bar nitrogen under nitrogen it had to be stuffed at the destination this consignee should have discharged the tank using nitrogen and after discharge this tank should have been repurged with nitrogen at minimum 0.2 bar and that should have been maintained until the tank is ready to clean now this is such a process that you cannot avoid and by avoiding this you are only exposing the risk that you are having to uh, you know do in terms of the financial loss that you would incur by not having communicated clearly this tank also had to have a working pressure gauge and you should have had should have been fitted with a super tank tight gasket so these are the uh, two case studies that we come across you know in uh, in our experience and uh, and we would definitely would appreciate that sales persons who are there involved in this particular job is correctly checking with the technical teams and informing the shipper in advance before the execution of the shipment over to you shashi uh, thanks binoy uh, for highlighting the uh, these two case studies um, uh, it reiterates the importance of uh, following the imdg code Uh, IMDG code is mandatory. IMDG code became mandatory uh, for dangerous goods in package form from first uh, January two thousand four, and uh, since first January two thousand ten onwards, it is as per IMDG code, it is mandatory that the shore side people are trained in IMDG code. Uh, when we talk about IMDG code's responsible parties, there are only three parties by name IMDG code calls. Uh, that is master of the vessel, shipper, and packer of the container. Uh, if it is a factory stuff shipper themselves will be the packers and apart from master shipper and packer of the container it is uh, then competent authority of the different countries for uh, implementing the code but when we talk about freight forwarders nbocs uh, tank operators etc many people in the industry think that they are not involved uh, uh, in the responsibilities because you know they are just providing certain equipments or providing certain services that is not true uh, the best case is uh, to refer is about the msc flaminia accident where the tank operator was held responsible uh, for the loss of lives and uh, loss of property worth billions uh, almost 45% of the uh, loss was uh, put on the tank operator's shoulder uh, similarly uh, imdg code is a mandatory uh, regulation we all know that imdg code is available in printed books Uh, you can uh, browse through the IMO's website for the authorized dealers. IMDG code is also available as uh, e-solution. 
uh, like has check online and uh, e-readers uh, in English, Portuguese and Spanish languages, etc. Uh, which you can find out from IMO's website or you can visit the service provider Exis Technologies or also you can visit my website and go on to the IMBG code online section where you can find these solutions for purchasing. Now, let me uh, uh, talk something uh, more about this uh, apart from IMDG code. There is something called CTU code, uh, that is uh, Cargo Transport Unit code, jointly published by International Maritime Organization, International Labor Organization and the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. Uh, now, in that CTU code, there is informative material which is very useful for the shippers and others using containers for uh, transporting goods, including dangerous goods, all type of goods. Uh, I will uh, mention about the mentioning of uh, freight forwarders in IMO's document. Uh, there is a circular by Maritime Safety Committee. Uh, the circular name is uh, Due Diligence Checklist for uh, Selecting Operators, uh, CTU Operators, that is Container Operators. In that, they have mentioned that freight forwarders' responsibility as introducing the CTU code to the shippers, uh, verifying whether the shippers are following the CTU code, also verifying whether the shippers, uh, the staff at shippers office are trained in IMDG code, do they maintain a training record. Now, when it comes to the question whether salespeople should be trained in IMDG code or not, by referring to our discussion and highlights given by Bijoy, case studies delivered by Binoy, we will understand that it is imperative that the salespeople must have certain knowledge about IMDG code, it is better they undertake a dangerous goods training, whether it can be an online training or e-learning, uh, that is also available through Exis Technology, which you can uh, see the details on my website or you can visit uh, Exis Technologies website. Uh, you can, uh, anybody having any questions, uh, you can uh, type it on the chat. Uh, we will uh, answer the questions uh, as far as uh, we know. If we do not know the answer, we will come back to you later through email. So open to everybody who is attending this uh, to start asking your questions. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you, Shashi. Thank you, Binay, for your inputs. And uh, uh, we will await uh, for some queries from uh, or uh, any questions from our participants. And uh, we will try our best to answer them to the best of our knowledge. Yes, uh, Bijoy, there is one question uh, from Nikshit asking, do you handle domestic transport of dangerous goods in tanks? The answer is yes, but uh, this is uh, actually a forum for training. Uh, so we can discuss this offline. Okay. Another question, how to determine the perfect time to pitch the quotation for sales? Now, uh, I'll, I'll take this answer. I'll take this question. Uh, there is no such thing as perfect time. You know, um, it's not as if it's a cooking recipe and, uh, you know, you gaze the temper temperature or, the, uh, or put a thermometer into the food and check whether it is cooked inside or not. Uh, so uh, the, the answer really comes from your ability to read the mind of your customer. Uh, actually, a sales and marketing job, the skill really is in your ability to read what will happen in the future. So we cannot give a formula that this is the way it has to be done uh, you have to be intuitive about it uh, my experience says that um, if you are a, a keen salesperson you will be able to pick up the cues uh, at the right time is there any other question have i answered your question properly yes i think you have answered uh, uh, anybody having any other question you can type it in the chat Uh, okay, one more question I will answer that. The question is uh, how to handle uh, S HSDG. Uh, I believe, Nikshid, uh, are you talking about high consequence dangerous goods? Nikshid, uh, can you elaborate your question on HSDG, whether it is high consequence dangerous goods? Yeah, high security dangerous goods. Okay. Uh, there is. Uh, couple of uh, UN numbers and all almost all the classes are listed down in chapter 1.4 of IMDG code, uh, which uh, highlights them as high consequence dangerous goods. 
So if we are uh, undertaking any transport operation or temporary keeping, that is, uh, you know, warehousing temporary for high consequence dangerous goods, uh, the security in charge of that uh, company must uh, verify all the security threats which can be expected for that uh, high consequence dangerous goods and deploy or employ additional security measures such as uh, uh, security cameras, uh, police escort on, on the route or private security, additional private security, 24 hour guard, etc. It all depends upon what is the high consequence dangerous goods uh, we are handling and uh, which part of the country or globe or where we are transporting and what is the perceived threat. I hope I have answered about that. Uh, there are two articles on my website about security. Uh, I will uh, share that articles uh, which uh, may give you more inputs. Okay, one more question. Sometimes shippers do not declare uh, it as dangerous goods and once the good reaches the uh, product wherever, then it is dangerous goods. Yes, uh, this is a very rampant issue of misdeclaration of dangerous goods. Most of the accidents happening out at sea is because of misdeclared or undeclared dangerous goods. So, if uh, forwarders and NVOCs or whoever dealing with shippers, if they have the basic knowledge of IMDG code and related uh, transport of dangerous goods regulations, they may be able to educate or guide the ignorant shippers. I'm not talking about willful uh, defaulters. There are very less people, you know, minute uh, shippers are the who willfully default. Uh, uh, forget about that part. That may be very difficult to find out. But uh, many of them are ignorant. So the first question, uh, if we are dealing with dangerous goods, should be that are your people trained? Do they have a copy of IMDG code? If they are at least they are having a copy of IMDG code, then it will be more easier for us to guide them. Thank you. Any other questions? If you have, uh, you can uh, ask on the chat. Okay, Vijay, I think uh, that's it about the I, question. Yes, I think uh, it was a good session. Uh, it was kind of a refresher. But I see one more question that's just come in from Nishit. How do you transport RM in ocean mode? Uh, sorry, what does RM mean, uh, Nishit? Okay, I was thinking whether it is radioactive material. Uh, radioactive material are uh, uh, regulated by IMDG code under class nine, uh, class seven. Sorry, class seven. Uh, but most of the carriers, unfortunately, most, they, it is very safe to carry if we, if the shipper has followed uh, everything according to IMDG code. That is including the uh, what you call packaging declarations, etc. And the vessel owner has taken the additional PNI coverage, all those things. But many or most of the carriers do not accept that. Uh, one reason is that the high risk in that. Another reason, most of the way ports do not accept even radioactive con uh, container on board as transit cargo. So if a vessel is carrying radioactive, even one single unit of radioactive container, the, the way ports may reject that vessel. Because of that, uh, there is a uh, you know great difficulty in transporting radioactive materials. Uh, there are some uh, shippers who use uh, chartered vessel, brake bulk vessels for carrying that. And some of the mainline carriers also do carry, like uh, Apogloid does carry uh, radioactive material. Uh, I noticed that there is one more question. Uh, I'll just read it out uh, for the benefit of everybody else. Do you agree that some companies using software and which present the prices immediately? So in this case, it is not recommended to offer client until the forwarder found the right time to offer. But what about quality control for timing? Now, if I've understood you correctly in this question, what you're referring to is that there are now digital models of freight forwarders. In India, we have uh, people like Kogo Port and various other companies who are uh, offering sea freight, uh, like you can, uh, like uh, make my trip, you know, or uh, clear trip, or you know, guys like that who. Uh, provide you the prices straight when you just click the port pair and you will get the price 
yes in in such cases um, it it is quite tricky uh, to uh, find out what is the timing at which we should offer now usually uh, so far i have seen that the uh, i have noticed especially from the indian perspective that uh, the, uh, the the digital uh, platforms are not able to actually penetrate so hard because a b2b business it is a little difficult to penetrate but it is only a matter of time before the penetration happens and until that time uh, the customer uses such models only as a referral point they usually have their own uh, forwarders uh, or their own uh, you know vendor list whom they will uh, send the uh, rates to and they will only use this as a referral point so um, i didn't quite understand uh, your question about the quality control but yes this is again you know an intuitive kind of thing your customer will most likely tell you that you know these are the rates that are available in the market what can you do can you improve on it or can you can you give me some additional facilities so again it's a matter of intuition uh, thank you okay uh, nikshit your question i think uh, reply on the chat also uh, about this accept uh, uh, package of radioactive again carriers are restricting that uh, i heard that hyperloid uh, do accept uh, i think uh, they used to accept you need to check with the shipping line whether with mers hapagloid msc cma or whoever then only we'll come to know their exact policy as of now uh nikshit uh, your question about gas cylinders uh, there is no un performance test certificate for gas cylinders uh, like uh, you may be asking from india india everybody knows about indian institute of packaging certificate like that but uh, uh, it must be a un cylinder that original certificate will be there with the shipper so that can be used uh, peso certificate is uh, specifically for the cylinders manufactured in india and using also peso do regulate the imported cylinders reusing in india so the, that uh, may require peso's uh, authentication for that uh, cylinders Uh, hi, Mr. Shashi. This is Nikshit. So, uh, if I am getting any uh, cylinders, let's say I'm importing some cylinder from uh, outside India, let's say China, and uh, I don't have a certificate for that particular receptacle, how would you suggest me to, you know, uh, clear a particular cargo, or what uh, certificate would suffice? Yeah. So when when you are getting the cylinders from China, that uh, Chinese supplier may be able to give you the Chinese certificate of that uh, cylinders test certificate. If that is not available, then uh, you may have to go for the local certification. If it, if in India it must be from uh, it has to be from peso. If the certificates or if the cylinders would have been made in accordance with some ISO standards that is given in IMDG, that would work. Yeah. Then again, if somebody asks, that should work actually. That must work. Like you know, uh, US cylinders are according to the DOT specification (DOT). So that should be uh, that is acceptable all over the world. Uh, but when it comes to again re-exporting to India, filling new gas, I am not really sure what is the peso stand uh, because uh, recently peso has uh, started uh, authorizing the P75 tank, UN portable tank for uh, liquid oxygen supply in India. These T seventy five tanks are already certified and classified by the classification society. Now peso is again reissuing a or not reissuing issuing a another certificate their organization. So that may uh, it may be applicable to cylinders also from India. I am not very sure about uh, peso stand on that. You may have to check up with peso. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. And whoever asked about the cost of e-learning, I will uh, send all of you about the products available in digital platform for IMDG code. Also, I will uh, share with the uh, with you all the link for downloading the CTU code and related material, which is uh, uh, freely available. And recently, uh, five of the international organization, uh, including uh, TT Club and Container Operators Association, they have published a uh, quick uh, checklist or guidance. For uh, checking the compliance to CTU code for dry containers, freight containers, uh, that is a ten-page document which is very useful for the compliance to CTU code. Uh, that also I will uh, share with you all. If nobody are having any other questions, uh, we can uh, finish this session. I thank all of you for joining, and uh, 
asking uh, good questions to make this uh, session lively. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I can see somebody has raised her hand. Uh, if there is still any question, maybe we can just take it one last question. Yeah, sure. Rajeshri, do you have a question? Oh, apparently it must be some kind of a mistake. But anyway, thank you everybody for joining in. And I will leave you with one quotable quote. The biggest investment that you make for your customer is your relationship. And the biggest investment that the customer makes on you is his trust. So please maintain your relationship and your customer's trust. Thank you so much for sparing the time this afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Uh, stay safe and uh, have a uh, nice weekend. Corona is still there, so be careful. Thank you, Shashi. Thank you, Bijoy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, sir.